This is the Content Marketing Podcast, episode number 163, the latest B2B content marketing insights from the B2B Content to Conversion Conference. Hello and welcome to the Content Marketing Podcast. This is the show where we help you attract and retain business through the power of quality content. I'm your host, Rachel Parker of Resonance Content Marketing, and today is February 25th, 2016. Hello, hello, or as we say in Texas, howdy, and thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Content Marketing Podcast. Just a reminder, we are live on iTunes and on Stitcher, so if you're listening to this episode on the blog, you can click on over and subscribe. And of course, if you use a different app for your podcast listening pleasure, we also have an RSS feed, and I will provide that link in the blog post. I also invite you to download our brand new ebook. It's called Ninja Secrets of B2B Blogging, and you can get your very own copy copy at b2bbloggingebook.com. And then, of course, is the numeral two in B2B. Last week, we welcomed special guest Tim Matthews to enlighten us on the art and science of creating powerful blog personas. If you happen to miss that episode, feel free to check it out on iTunes or Stitcher or via the RSS feed. Today, I'm sharing some of the latest B2B content marketing insights that I gained last week from David Meerman Scott, Lee Auden, and other speakers at, at the B2B Content to Conversion Conference. But first, it's time to check in with our news feed for this week's rundown of news you can use. Some news out of Facebook to kick off this week's news feed. Actually, two news stories out of Facebook. And, and this, is the, this is the Dr. Jekyll Facebook. This is the happy Facebook that with updates that we actually want to hear about. Uh, first thing is Facebook is opening up instant articles to all publishers. Now, you may have heard about instant articles, what that is. It is... Um, they created it to solve down the problems of slow load times, especially on mobile devices. So you would be on your phone, you would see an article on Facebook, tap on it, and then, of course, your phone has to switch over to your browser so that you can access the original in, the original website. Well, what Instant Articles allowed is, is it allowed the article to be opened up within Facebook, and that made for faster access and a better user experience. Now, Facebook kicked off this new feature with a few major media outlets, places like the New York Times and Bloomberg, but it will soon be open to all publishers, including, yes, us lowly bloggers. So this was a big announcement from Facebook, actually a pre-announcement of something that will be announced. So it's a pre-announcement before the announcement. And that is going to be at their F8 conference on April 12th. And that is when this feature will be rolled out to everyone. So stay tuned on that. Very good news for our audience, especially those who are checking us out on mobile devices. Devices. Okay, more news out of Facebook. Again, this is Dr. Jekyll. This is the good Facebook. Uh, Facebook has announced updates to video insights. Now, video is just becoming huge on Facebook. I, I've read reports that Facebook is starting to rival YouTube in terms of um, in, in terms of, of number of views and, and minutes viewed per day, etc. So Facebook is really kind of upping the ante on this whole video game. So the new update to Video Insights, in addition to analytics like total views, average percentage of completion, you'll soon be able to see total minutes viewed. So if of all the people who watch, how many total minutes they watched, uh, number of 10-second views, so how many people watched your video for 10 seconds and then bailed, and then the sound on versus sound off views. Um, very interesting. And, and supposedly it is... It is available now, but I just checked my page and my video insights look the same. So I'm guessing they are rolling this out gradually over the next few months or so. So keep an eye on your video insights and I will keep you posted for when those are um, live across the board. 
Okay, news also out of Twitter. Now, Twitter has been getting some some bad press lately. Um, a few of the executives resigned, and there were rumors about changes to the news feed that just set up an uproar. People were saying, um, you know, Twitter's dead. In fact, the hashtag RIP Twitter was showing up all over. Um, but some good news out of Twitter for those of us who use the network for customer service. And I recommend that we all do that because so much of customer service, uh, so many people People turn to Twitter when they have customer service issues. So Twitter has announced the rollout of two new features that will make it easier for our organizations to connect with their customers. The first feature makes it very easy to transition customer conversations from tweets to direct messages. And of course, the difference is, you know, when they're when you're just kind of tweeting back and forth, everybody who follows both of you can see that. And what you want to do is take it to direct messages, which is completely private between the two of you. So businesses can now add a deep link to their tweets that automatically displays a call to action button and that allows the customers to send the business a direct message without having to, you know, go to go to the page on Twitter and tap on direct message. They can get to that very quickly and very easily to take that um, conversation to a more private level. The second feature is called simply customer feedback and it is a um, it is a feedback mechanism within Twitter. It lets customers private share their feedback with businesses following an interaction. So customer service reps can use this feature, say, hey, um, for example, if someone has a conversation on Twitter or calls a call center or if they are somehow on Twitter, they can send the customer a link to this feature that will let them rate their experience. So, you know, one to ten highly likely than recommend, et cetera. And they can send open-ended comments directly to the business. And this is great for businesses because it, it compartmentalizes those customer service conversations separately from everything else and really lets us look at what issues are coming up and how they're resolved. And that's going to help us get better in how we serve our customers. Um, also a note with this feature, you can use two industry standard question formats. You can use the net promoter score format and also the customer satisfaction, also known as the CSAT format. So if you use either of those, you can migrate those over to Twitter customer service. And if you'd like to know more, I will provide a link to the original article from Twitter that will give you some more information. Okay, our content hit of the week is a post called Why You Need Two Types of Content Strategist. This was by Ann Rockley over on the Content Marketing Institute site. And we usually think of the content strategist as as kind of one person with one viewpoint. But Ann shows us that content marketing has evolved to where the the content strategist actually needs to wear two hats or we might even need to have two separate people to fill these roles. On the one hand, we have the front end content strategist and that is the, the strategist that is into the content itself and makes recommendations about the content, about the user experience, how our content can better serve audiences, et cetera, et cetera. But then we also have the back end content strategist and she concerns herself with things like using technology to handle all that content for maximum impact. So tackling question like, okay, how do we, how can we do more with the content resources that we already have? So a very, very interesting take on the content strategist role. So I recommend taking a look at Anne's post, and I will, of course, pri- provide the link in the blog post for this episode. That's it for this week's update. If you stumble across something you think might be of interest to your fellow content marketers, please shoot it on over to us so that we can share. Now it's time for this week's Spotlight segment. I am sharing the latest insights on B2B content marketing, courtesy of the speakers from last week's B2B Content to Conversion Conference. Last week, I had the pleasure of attending the 2016 B2B Content to Conversion Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, you know, almost as soon as I arrived, I realized I was with my tribe. (laughs) Okay. I was with my brethren. These were B2B marketers, both large and small, so from mega corporations down to smaller businesses, all of whom recognize the power of content and who have made a commitment to building relationships through a powerful content marketing program. So what I want to do today is to share some of my biggest takeaways from the various speakers, and those included David Meerman Scott, who you may know from his book, The New Rules of Marketing and PR. He is also credited with having coined the term 
term news jacking. And uh, another guru that I really enjoyed was Lee Oden. He is the CEO of Top Rank and also a guru regarding the intersection of content marketing and SEO. And they, they, both of them and all the speakers had tremendous insights to share. The first insight that that I real that was really an aha for me, or really, you know, confirmed something that's been on my mind for a while, was the distinction between B two B and B two C marketing. Um, if if there if there still is one, I was surprised by how infrequently I heard the term B two B. You know, I didn't hear people saying, well, for B2B marketers, this is what we have to do. Or in the B2B world, this is how this works. Um, I didn't hear that very often, nor was I surprised how often I heard about traditionally B2C brands such as Netflix. And and nobody nobody saw anything out of place with that. You know, I've, I've been in the past, I've been at... Um, B2B marketing presentations where they bring up a consumer brand and somebody says, hey, wait a minute, this is consumer. This isn't our world at all. And, and it, was, it was completely part of the flow. It was, um, it, was, it was just part of the conversation and no one saw anything out of, out of context with that. So we really need to break down these silo walls between B2B and B2C. Yes, in the B2B world, we do have some distinctions that make us different. We have a, typically a longer buying cycle. Um, our products and services are typically more complex. But at the end of the day, we are all marketing to people. And I heard more than once someone mention, it's not B2B or B2C, it's P2P. It's person to person. And really with the rise of bring your own device policies at certain workplaces and things like flex time and flex place, the, the walls between business and personal worlds are, are dissolving and not necessarily in a bad way, like people being letting their jobs creep into their family life. But I think people are, are taking a more personal interest in their work and seeing their work as part of part of the bigger picture that makes up their lives. So when it comes to dividing, defining our audiences and strategizing on the best ways to reach them, our methods are the same. We are both talking to people. We need to know not only um, what their job title is, what their function is, how long they've been with the company, but you know what are their personal pain points. And that is no different from the B2C side. So as nominally B2B marketers, we can't tune out best practices that places like Netflix have to offer. We need to realize there are lessons to be learned and strategies to be Yes, I'm going to say it's strategies to be stolen or, or borrowed from both sides of the table. The second insight that I want to share with you is several of the speakers touched on the question of to gate or not to gate when it comes to how we offer our content. And really, when, we, when it comes to those high-value pieces, those e-books, those, um, those, those video courses, the really, really meaty con con content, yes, I can pronounce content, it's become a reflex. You know, we create this high-value resource, and of course we're going to put it on a landing page, and of course we're going to ask for your email address. And I mean, that's why we produce these, right? These are lead-generating assets. And, you know, something David Meerman Scott shared is that lead generation calculus has changed. And he shared some statistics. For example, the traditional landing page where you submit your name and email address, possibly some other information, those get about, um, and this was in one study, those got about 5% response, 5% conversion, people who actually filled it out and requested the resource. Whereas content that is out there totally free with no strings attached had a 50% download rate rate and tons of tons more social media shares got a lot more traffic um on the other side you know the business doesn't get any email addresses out of it and people panic when they hear about this it's like oh my god i'm not going to get any email address how am i going to get those leads how am i going to you know how is this asset going to pay off for me um but really you know if you think about something that has a 50 percent download rate that puts an an asset with your branding on it into the hands of more people and get shared on social media, that's pretty valuable. Whether it's more valuable than the email addresses you would have gotten, that's up to you to distinguish. But we need to start opening our minds and exploring different perspectives when it comes to gated versus free content. Uh, for example, David offered a hybrid approach that he has used in the past is to offer um, something of high value for free. So a high value resource and then include in that resource a link to something even that is related, but of even higher value, which is itself behind a gate. So 
you may release an ebook free for download, you know, no gating, um, no gating requested, but you might have a link in there to a, um, to a video training that would be, um, free in terms of, of no, no dollars exchange, but it would be behind a gated platform. And he has, um, Behind, behind a gated page, excuse me. Uh, he said he has used that approach in the past. So that is just one one idea to to reconciling the to gate or not to gate question. But we really need to start looking at this. We need to start looking at what do we offer gated, what do we offer free, and what makes sense going forward. And we need to figure out what's right to help us reach the individual goals for our organization. There was also a lot of talk about timing of our content, using timing to deliver the right content at the right time. And David Meerman Scott, he was the keynote speaker, but he also did a breakout session on newsjacking, which is appropriate since he is uh, attribute. it is attributed to him to have coined the phrase newsjacking and even wrote a book about it. And he said, the problem with content marketers is that we tend to live in the future. We set out our editorial calendars, we build our content schedules around the times of the year, around our trade shows, around our product launches, other things that we know is going to be going on in that future, but we tend to take our attention off the present, which offers tremendous opportunities for getting a jump on those newsjacking opportunities. And he brought up, of course, the most famous, I think the most famous um, example of newsjacking in recent memory is the Oreo Super Bowl ad. When the lights went out at the Super Bowl, was this, remind me, was this 2013, 20, you had 2013. I think it was 2013, uh, the Super Bowl that was in New Orleans. And the lights went out, and Oreo published a very simple graphic that said, you can still dunk in the dark. And it showed a picture of Oreos next to a glass of milk. Everybody went wild over it. I think they won an Addy Award for it. And David said, he said, I don't like this example. He doesn't like this example because the Super Bowl is a big event. Marketers know it's coming. They watch it on the edge of their seats looking for something to, to comment on or to, to newsjack. And what David says, no, we need to keep our eyes open every single day. We need to be looking at what is going on in the world every day, not just during those big events that we know are coming up. And he shared a great example from a uh, news story that involved Lindsay Lohan and her her financial woes. Apparently she has run up a lot of debt and no way to pay it off, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a brand called cashforpurses.com actually published a, I don't, I don't know if it was a tweet or a Facebook post, but they said, hey, Lindsay, it's okay. We'll buy your handbags. And that just got, the, the, the post went viral and it got them tremendous exposure. So one thing he suggested is checking Google News every single morning and, and checking it why you're logged out. Because if you're logged in, Google is going to serve up the news that it thinks you're interested in. But if you're logged out, then it's a more objective view of what is getting the most buzz today. And then we can look for opportunities to hop onto those stories as appropriate. You know, we want to be very careful with negative news, no no commenting on natural disasters or, or deaths. Um, just you know, be, be very mindful. And he spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, Speaking of real time, something that they did at this conference that was really, really neat, they engaged a company called Quarry, Q-U-A-R-R-Y, and this company brought in artists to create real-time infographics of the presentations as they were taking place. They're called Keynote Inks, and it was fascinating to watch. You'd be watching a speaker, and then off to the side would be someone um, frantically working away on a whiteboard creating these Keynote Inks, these real-time infographics. And it, it was fascinating. It was very different, and those images got a lot of traffic on Twitter and Instagram and and other sites and generate a lot of buzz for the conference. So speaking of that, the last point I want to talk about is creativity. Several of the speakers mentioned that as traditionally we think of content that is fun and super engaging, uh, that uses humor and pop culture, we think of those as ex- exclusively the bailiwick of the B2C world. And B2B has to be very buttoned up and pinstriped and, you know, we can't deal with all that foolishness. No, folks, when you think about all the millions of messages that our customers are being bombarded with every single day, we need to tap into our creativity. We need to loosen up, lighten up, uh, use humor as appropriately, of course, um, 
and just explore more creative ways to getting getting in front of our audience. Um, David Meerman Scott said something I love. He says, B2B does not equal B2 boring. Okay. We need to be creative. We need to unleash our our team's um, brainstorm about how we can be more creative. Getting back to my first point, how can we tap into those best practices from the B2C world to be more eye-catching, more engaging, and to really get the attention of the people in our target audience. So there were plenty more insights to be shared at this conference. I was going through my notes saying, oh my gosh, how am I going to pick four or five points to talk about? Um, If you want to check out some of the presentations, go to content2conversion.com, and that's the numeral two. Two. So content numeral two conversion dot com. They have uh, links to the presentations, which are available on SlideShare, and there are also those very cool keynote inks, the real-time infographics that were created during the conference. And you can also go to Twitter at hashtag C2C16, again, the numeral 2, C2C16. So if you have any questions about the insights I've shared or want to add to the conversation, I would love to hear from you. And the best way to reach me is through our website, resonancecontent.com. Now it's time for our content marketing tip of the week. For today's tip, I want to talk about getting out of a rut when it comes to our continuing education. You know, if someone had asked me, are are you committed to your continuing education? I would say, well, of course, I read books and I read blogs and I attend webinars. But this B2B C2C conference was actually the first live in-person conference I've been to in quite a while. And it reminded me of how important it is to make time and set aside budget to attend these events. And I think as content marketers or as marketers in general, we tend to get into a rut. And I put myself in that in that group absolutely. We have our we read our books, we read our blogs, we attend webinars, we get those training online training courses, but there is just no substitute for being immersed in a subject for two to three days. And more than that, to interact with your colleagues, to learn from people, people who are leading the way and also people who are walking the same path as you and be able to kick around ideas and establish connections that you can form relationships with. So for your for your tip this week, I want to encourage you to check out a conference or two this year. You will have many options available to you. I promise conference, marketing conferences are um, happening every every almost every day. I can't say every day, but there are a lot of them out there. Pick two or three or maybe just one that you think looks interesting and will help you grow as a content marketer. And I promise you, you will be the richer for it. Okay, campers, that is it for me today. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Content Marketing Podcast. If you like what you've heard, please feel free to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher or via our RSS feed. And if you really like what you've heard, please leave us a quick review on iTunes. Also, don't forget to grab your free copy of our latest ebook, Ninja Secrets of B2B Blogging at b2bbloggingebook.com. As always, I'd like to leave you with a quote, and today's comes from one of my favorite German poets, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He once said, quote, Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Willing is not enough. We must do. Unquote. Again, this is Rachel Parker with Resonance Content Marketing. Thank you again for listening, and we will see you again next week. Take care.